I'll tell you, the reason you don't have groupies is you play that sorry trumpet all the time. <laughs> You know, we used to have a man on our faculty, his name is Harold Honer, and Harold always sat in, in the chapel, right down here, right where the spit valve from that trumpet. <laughs> and Bill would often turn that trumpet and play it right at Harold, and Harold just sat there so calmly and quietly, and people didn't know it, but he's deaf in that ear as a result of the... Horn Bill kept blowing on him, but uh, gosh, retiring after all these years. Terrific, Bill. Thank you for all that good work you do. You're a great sport. When you retire, you can give up that trumpet, too, I want to tell you. If you want. <laughs> well, as you've guessed by now, they don't bring me here to encourage you academically. Though I really do believe in what you're doing here, um, and I do applaud you for pursuing your degrees, uh, I, I have to say that uh, this is a place of theory. It's a place of uh, academia, and it needs to be. But there is nothing theoretical or academic about ministry. And therein lies the rub. And that's the reason I sometimes show up to uh, address some of the reality unrelated to uh, the academic world. I, I believe in what you're doing, and I, I applaud the plan as it unfolds. And I know in order to get a degree, you have to do a number of things that require academic a discipline, in some of your cases, uh, excellence. You are very bright people, and you wouldn't be here if you weren't. I, I have no sarcasm in, in saying that. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with your ability and with this faculty to uh, lead you into realms that you would not otherwise go on your own. But there is no required reading once you're out of here. There is no written testing once you're gone from here. There are no semesters. There is no classroom. But there are constant examinations. Not the kind a professor will give you and grade but examinations on life, because see, you can, you can form habits here that are, that are very destructive in a ministry out there in the middle of nowhere when there are, are no longer professors to look over your work or those who keep the record of your uh, accomplishments academically. You will not fail or be disqualified in ministry because of uh, intellectual failure. You will fail because of character failure. That's where you'll fail. And uh, nobody here wants that for you. But there's only so much a school can do. It doesn't do magic. And if you don't come with some things in place, if you're not careful in this dangerous place, you learn to fake it. And uh, because you're capable intellectually and able to ace uh, many of the exams, you can begin to believe your own stuff and think that it's going to, that's going to qualify you for ministry, and it does not. In ministry, the secrets ultimately become known, as in a home. One of the great things about home is constant accountability from parents and siblings. None of them is impressed with you. <laughs> and you know that. When you go, you know, a prophets without honor, right there at home. That's why I always shudder when I go back to Houston. Uh, it was where my, my, most of my roots are and and I remember 
our band instructor, Eugene C. Strand, looking at me with shock when I went back to campus to visit. He said, you're supposed to be an Alcatraz. That's a nice gathering of thoughts there. But when you are in ministry, uh, the truth is, becomes known. It isn't long before folks notice that you're discourteous or selfish or you uh, are envious or you're rude or you lack forgiveness or you don't do well as it relates to sharing the credit that another person really deserves. Which made me appreciate this uh, little piece I came across a few years ago. It's a picture of an old lady that's got a face like about eight miles of bad road in Mississippi. Uh, and it reads, in a, in a trial, a southern small town prosecuting attorney called his first witness, a grandmotherly elderly woman to, to take the stand. He approached her and asked, uh, Mrs. Jones, do you know me? She responded with a shrug, well, yeah, I, I do know you, Mr. Williams. I've known you since you were a little boy, and frankly, you've been a big disappointment to me. <laughs> you lie, you cheat on your wife, and you manipulate people. You talk about them behind their backs. You think you're a big shot when you haven't the brains to realize you'll never amount to anything more than a two-bit paper pusher. Yep, I know you. The lawyers a little stunned, not knowing exactly what else to do, pointed to the attorney across the room and said, Ms. Jones, do you know the defense attorney? <laughs> she replied, yeah, I know him too. I've known Bradley since he was a youngster. He's lazy, bigoted, has a drinking problem. He can't build a normal relationship with anyone, and his law practice is one of the worst in our entire state. Not to mention, he cheated on his wife with three different women. One of them was your wife. <laughs> yeah, I know, Bradley. Defense attorney nearly passed out. The judge asked both counselors to approach the bench in a quiet voice, said, if either of you idiots ask her if she knows me, you're going right to the electric chair. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> they get to know you in ministry, and they are not impressed. You're not there to make a great impression. You're there to exalt the Savior. They will be grateful for the end, to the end of their life that you help them understand his word better and that you model his truth as best you could, given your old nature, and the things that mark you as a human being, because you carry all of that with you. All of that goes with you. All the bad habits you cultivated in college, you brought with you to seminary. And unless something rather significant happens, you'll only get better at covering them up rather than dealing with them, which is the benefit of being involved in spiritual formation. Nobody asked me to, to underscore the value of that. But you who are really, really bright and really academically gifted will tend to overlook that. You won't see that as very intellectually challenging. So you'll do what's required, and that's about it. You won't really throw yourself into it. When, in fact, some of you really need serious attention to your character because you're phony. Some of you more than others, all of us a little bit. And because that's true, I shudder a little when I think of you getting through here with great grades and a rotten attitude. Or maybe put it in a little nicer, just a selfish spirit. I care about that. I was sitting on a platform about to speak at a commencement for a Christian 
college, sitting next to a classmate of mine. Actually, he was a couple years behind me, and we had gotten to know each other as I was finishing, and he was starting here at school. And so we caught up on each other's life. It was great to be. That's one of the great things about the camaraderie of the graduates of our school. And he, he and I were talking, and it happened to be a commencement where they also gave the awards. Here at seminary, we do an awards chapel just before the commencement ceremony. I, I like that, dividing them up. But at that school, they, they gave awards the same day they, they graduate students. And it was, a, it was a large class, about 300. And um, the young lady who won the academic award, she's valedictorian, 4.4, as I recall, graduating uh, top of her class. When they called her name and to come up and get the award, the place just exploded. And I noticed my buddy sitting next to me doing applauding. Uh, and I leaned over and I said, uh, you must know something nobody else knows. He said, you know, kind of whispered this as everybody was fawning over her. He said, uh, I, I wish we gave awards for great attitude." Because hers stinks. He said the tragedy, and he said all of this just in a few few seconds of time. And I didn't know her, and I've not talked to him since. But he said, you know, I deal with her. And she is very, very bright and very obnoxious. But we don't grade that. I wish we graded that at the seminary. We sort of do in some classes, but most of them, the profs are really nice and they'll, they'll courteously overlook your rudeness, your arrogance. Now, what does that have to do with what I've got to say today? That's a lot. Uh, I'm here to bring a little reality to uh, your world because that's my world. Uh, my world is a body of 11 elders to whom I am intimately account with whom I'm intimately accountable. We met just yesterday morning for two and a half hours. Yeah, by the way, I didn't plan to say this, but I, I will add. I decided over the holidays that I would put together eight commitments of my life for, 19, for uh, 2015. And I wrote them down, all eight. I typed them up, uh, ran them off, took them to the meeting, and gave them out to the guys. I said, I want all of you to hold me accountable. These are eight areas where I feel my life needs attention and I want to be better at it at the end of the year than I am at it right now. And uh, I, in fact, read the, the commitments to No one asked me to do that. They were very gracious and finest group of elders I've ever worked with in any church. Uh, one of them is Stan Toussaint, by the way. Man, I respect with every fiber of my being. And he had the courtesy to thank me for that after that. But I didn't do it to get thanks. I did it because I want them to know on the front end as the year starts that I, an 80-year-old pastor serving a church with a wide variety of ages and stages of people, I know that I can begin to slip. I know that I can get lazy. And I know that I can uh, get away with things if for no other reason than my age or what little bit of reputation I've been able to build over the years. I don't want to do that. I don't want to get away with anything that is inappropriate and diminishes the glory of Christ and his role in my life and his work in my life. I have a long ways to go in areas uh, like you do. So when I speak to you rather forcefully, as I have, I will always tell you the truth. I will never lie to you. 
And, and I will always address issues that are real issues. I don't make them up. Because you will be there when I'm dead and gone. And you will be there when no prof is there to correct a paper or to rearrange your thinking in an area where you're moving into error. That's why you can slip easily in ministry. If you're not accountable to those who hold your feet to the fire theologically. And if you don't read on your own, all your reading is dated. And so one of my commitments was to stay up on where we are, never forgetting that God is sovereign over it all. So I stand with you today as a fellow sinner, just a few more years in my life than you have, but the book that I love and from which I preach with all the passion I can muster is filled with very wise directives that I'm to take personally, regardless of achievements or academic accomplishment, as in your case, or what other people may think. I know myself too well to know that I could easily fake it. So can you. When I started last semester with you as a, my first time to, to speak in chapel, I, uh, I had everybody turn to Philippians 3.10, where uh, I'm turning right now. And uh, uh, I, I call this Paul's great passion. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, that I may know him. The uh, Amplified Bible does a masterful piece of work in just doing that, amplifying it. For my determined purpose in life is that I may know him, that is, that I may become increasingly more intimately acquainted with him. Intimately, intimately. I think of my wife and myself as intimate partners. 59 years, this year 60 years together, she knows me. She is not impressed with me. <laughs> but she loves me too much to let me get away with stuff that is really ugly and inappropriate. And so, if I'm going to become intimately acquainted with her, I'm going to open her uh, open myself to her and have no secrets, nothing hidden. And I'm going to listen when she corrects me and tells me, you know, you're getting a little sloppy on the red lights. She's right. I think red lights last too long. <laughs> and and uh, the yellow light goes red too quickly. And uh, the other day, as I went, Went past a, it was kind of pink, <laughs> kind of a pink color. And all of a sudden, a bright a light went on from a camera. Right. That's what, that's what I did. Oh, man. So I went home, walked in. Well, how was the time with Parker? It was great, really good. She said, That's good. Everything okay? I said, No, I, I just had my picture taken. <laughs> Actually, not my picture, but uh, the, the car's picture. She goes, oh, man. <laughs> so the other day when the mail came, she brings it in. Here's some mail you may want to open. <laughs> that I may know Christ so deeply and so intimately that I'm aware of the fact that I am impatient. And I don't keep that from you or anyone, I acknowledge it. I face it. I have nothing to lose by telling you that that is a weakness in my life. I, I will on occasion, unguarded moments, say to the Lord, just simple prayer, just hurry up. Come on, Lord. 
I've been asking you this for the last hour. <laughs> As if an hour is an event. But he doesn't run his life, my life, like I want it run. So I adapt to him. It's called submission. Or one of the disciplines of the godly life, surrender. And it doesn't come easily. If we are to become intimately acquainted with him so that he really has the right to rule every part of our lives, then there's going to be a place where it's either my will or his will, and I have to learn to surrender. And so do you. I don't care how bright you are. I don't care how well you do at school. You fail to submit. You fight surrender. You're going to pay for it. You're going to make a fool of yourself. You're going to drive your kids away from you. And before long, you'll, you'll be grateful your mate is still with you because of the way you've been acting. See what I'm saying? This stuff at Dallas Seminary, as magnificent as it is, I don't know of a better place to train for ministry. They don't train you in being patient. That's kind of a byproduct that they hope you will get hold of, but if you're not careful, you won't. And you came greedy, you'll leave greedy. You came lustful, you'll leave lustful. But the problem is, the brighter you get, the better you get at wearing the mask and covering it up and acting like that's not a battle. Ministry will bring it out. Now, whatever may be the ministry, whatever may be the realm of ministry, maybe serving in some mission thousands of miles away, it'll happen there. Maybe a parachurch ministry, perhaps you'll be used in the realm of the arts, it'll happen there. You may step into a local pastoral role as an assistant or part of the staff or a senior member of the staff. And they'll really know you. And you know what? They, they really will want to respect you and admire you and, and love you. And one of the secrets, as I learned from Jim Peterson with the Navigators many, many years ago, is to let them see the cracks in your life. Let them see them. That's why I say to guys that go and do the candidating sermon at a church, don't preach your best stuff. They'll expect that all the time. <laughs> you know, preach, preach a reasonably good message. But, boy, if you knock it out of the park, they expect you to be a home run hitter every time you get up there. And you're not. You're not that good. But they'll think that if you try to impress them with this, you know, sugar stick that you've, you're able to deliver so well. An intimate walk with Christ means that I tell the truth regardless. Now, uh, hold a place in Philippians. We're going to be back in chapter 2 in a second. But look at Hebrews. Yeah, Hebrews 12. You got a Bible? Okay, good. Hebrews 12. Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. And isn't that a great word picture? It's a picture of an arena. An arena is made up of two groups. All the people in the stands, often thousands, and those on the field. The athletes and the spectators. And you're among the athletes engaged. In this case, all the spectators are dead. But they are living martyron. We got a word martyr from it. They are the witnesses. They are the ones saying, you can do it. I've been there. I know it's hard. You can make it. Stay with it. 
There are your witnesses that surround you. However you want to take that, he describes them as a cloud of witnesses. And they surround us. And by the way, this school, <coughs> forgive me, <coughs> at this school, you're surrounded by the history of 90 years of people that have done it. And we're all pulling for you. We want you to finish what you've started. Don't quit. Don't pull up. Don't cut it short. And we know it's tough. It's supposed to be tough. Ministry is tough. If it isn't tough, it isn't ministry. Uh, Jowett, the great preacher, said, ministry that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. It's cost me my whole life. It's a, what a great investment. But it's taken me from my family at times when I'd rather have been there. It's interrupted a, a plan that I had. It requires of me to listen when I'd rather talk. Yeah, I'm better at talking than listening. I'm not a real good listener. So I've learned to listen better and on and on. But these, these witnesses that surround you, all these, all completely human, all of them, and they're saying, in effect, you're there now, you're on the field, you're about to run that race. In fact, you're engaged in it. Run it. But before you run it, look at the order. Look at it. Let us lay aside Every encumbrance, that's before getting in the blocks and, and, and taking off on the relay or the race. You've never seen a runner keep the sweat clothes on at the time of the running. He's stripped down to the bare essentials, and you get rid of those things that are entangling us encumbrances. That's what I've been talking about. Lying is an encumbrance. Taking credit that someone else deserves is, is, an, is an encumbrance. Striving for your own way, though doing it deceitfully, is an encumbrance. And on and on you could list them. I, I've no corner on understanding. You've got as good imagination as I do. But lay that aside. And he then mentions the sin, definite article, different from encumbrances, more general. This is the sin. I think in context, it is the sin of unbelief. Chapter 11 is all about the people of faith. goes back to the end of chapter 10 in context, takes you into the first three verses of chapter 12. All of that is in a segment of this section that the writer is addressing. But the sin that besets you and me is the sin of unbelief. It's a constant battle. Remember the great words from Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding. Remember those words? In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he'll make your path straight. Remember that? You memorized it when you were in Sunday school or maybe a vacation Bible school or perhaps with some uh, group you were meeting with. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. All your heart, all your ways, <laughs> big as life, stands out. Trust him with all your heart. This seminary course that you're taking right now and every time you are back here every semester, will be a test of your faith. Trust God. Trust him. He will not let you down. He will not give you your way. He will not say yes when you need a no. Trust him to lead. Trust him to provide. It is the sin that easily entangles us. So I surrender to him out of trust in him. And he's there 
and he won't let you down. He doesn't speak audibly, so you don't always know what his agenda is. It's different than you thought it was. Unless you're very unusual, you missed it by a mile. Because your training won't lead to where you think. It will lead to where he's planned. And for each one of you, that's a unique destination with a unique set of experiences that you will go with. My experience at this school of uh, four years uh, is like no other person I've ever visited with. There are similarities in places, but the details are different. Your details are different. Cynthia learned things as a result of being with me those four years that we still talk about. And on and on I could go. But each, was, uh, it seemed, was a test of our faith to trust him. Trust him. Lean on him. You're worried about finances. That means you're not trusting him. Your worry is draining you of energy that you need to apply to your studies, to your work, to your occupation, to your home and family, if you have one here. That it is the sin that easily entangles itself around us, and, and it, it besets us, the easily besetting sin. Trust him. Trust him. Listen to Dennis next week. Outstanding uh, uh, representative of the Lord Jesus. Good friend. Dennis and Barbara. All the stuff they've gone through. Uh, he has things to teach you. Trust the Lord to speak through his mouth to say things. Don't, don't miss that week. Or think it's a time to kind of hang out uh, elsewhere. You, you be right here. Drink that in. Some of the best stuff we got in my years here, we got from what we call then the Bible Lecture Series or the Spiritual Life Week. And I can, I can quote lines that I heard that came from those who, who spoke here. What a privilege to hear Dennis, who comes to you to deliver this. It's all part of your training. But you're arrogant. And you're self-sufficient. And you're bright. And you will therefore convince yourself you don't really need what Dennis Rainey has to say. You, you do need it. One more passage, okay? Philippians 2. This will eat your lunch. You think three got to you. Look at chapter 2. Talking about surrendering your will. Verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Now there's a mouthful and worth three sermons. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, look at this. This is for you, seminary students. This is for me, preacher. This is for you, faculty members. This is for you, administration. This is for all of y'all. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. That's a tough assignment. Doesn't mean just holding the door open so somebody else can walk in before you do. No, that's a courteous thing to do. There's a word borrowed from German for the pleasure we take in the disappointments and suffering of others. It's schadenfreude. Schadenfreude is the basic principle behind 90% of reality TV. The opposite is a specific kind of jealousy. Listen to this. This is the story of your life in ministry, unless you're going to be really different. Being depressed by the good fortune of others. Envy is an ugly emotion and an even worse lifestyle. 
and it doesn't get any less ugly when you try to accessorize it as idealism, pretending that your jealousy is a sense of justice or fairness, for example. Unfortunately, it is the common lot of mankind not only to covet your neighbor's ass, I'm using the term biblically, <laughs> he, says, he says it here, <laughs> but also to be annoyed and irritable if he has an especially nice one. I learned this one afternoon in a hotel room in Washington, D.C. An acquaintance of mine had recently published a quite successful book and was getting both good reviews and healthy sales. As it ha happened, the author deserved all of this success because the book was well done, timely, and an important addition to the public debate. So I was depressed. A recent book of my own on a similar subject had not been nearly as successful. So watching the other author's celebrity was a bit like a root canal for my ego. My relative lack of success was in no way caused by the other author. And his success took nothing away from me, but I was nevertheless in a deep funk. I also had a decision to make. As it turned out, he was having a book signing party at a local Washington bookstore that evening. Should I go? The question made as much sense as, how would I like a hot, sharp stick poked in my eye? <laughs> but I thought about it. Youth has its passion, but age has its bitterness. Whoa. And frankly, I didn't like the way it felt. First of all, it was pointless. What good did it do me to be depressed about someone else's success? It's one thing to be down about your own failure, although you shouldn't dwell on it. But what possible reason would you have to wallow in self-pity over someone else's good fortune? Isn't that a good question? More good stuff he writes, but that's one you're going to have to fight. I don't know of any sin more subtle or more uh, famous in ministry than envy. You'll fight it constantly unless you're really a cut above. And if you are, I admire you. To applaud the success of a classmate... To graduate and to know what kind of a classmate he or she was and then to see that success wash over them when you really may have studied harder or maybe even made better grades. But success doesn't come to you like it comes to her or to him. And you're going to fight that. That ugly envy will emerge again and again and again until you finally look yourself in the mirror and say, knock it off. What an ugly way to respond to this brother or this sister who deserves every bit of the, of the uh, accolades that she's receiving. Don't do anything from selfishness or empty conceit, but with the humility of mind, regard each as more important than himself. Don't merely look out for your own personal interests, but the interests of others. Practice that at DTS. I got to quit. I wish before you leave you'd buy a copy of uh, The Valley of Vision. It's a series of Puritan prayers. This is my second time through it. I've about worn this one out. I wore out another one. So uh, you, you know it's, it's worth reading. I read them from time to time. Very eloquent words that may be sound dated, but have a relevant ring to them. And I close with these words. I'm a shell full of dust, made anew by an unseen power of grace. Yet I'm no rare object of valuable price, but one who has nothing and is nothing, although chosen from thee, of thee from eternity. And born again. I'm deeply convinced of the evil and misery of, of my sinful state. 
of the vanity of creatures, but also of the sufficiency of Christ. Now listen closely. When thou wouldest guide me, I control myself. When thou wouldest be sovereign, I rule myself. When thou wouldest take care of me, I suffice myself. When I should depend on thy providings, I supply myself. When I should submit to thy providence, I follow my will. When I should study, love, honor, trust thee, I serve myself. I fault and correct thy laws to suit myself. Instead of thee, I look to man's approbation. I am by nature an idolater. Lord, it is my chief design to bring my heart back to thee. Convince me that I cannot be my own God or make myself happy. Nor my own Christ to restore my joy. Nor my own spirit to teach, guide, and rule me. Help me to see that grace does this by providential affliction. For when my credit is God, thou dost cast me lower. When riches are my idol, thou dost wing them away. When pleasure is my all, thou dost turn it into bitterness. Take away my roving eye, my curious ear, my greedy appetite, my lustful heart. Show me that none of these things can heal a wounded conscience or support a tottering frame or uphold a departing spirit. Take me to the cross and leave me there. Take me to the cross and leave me there. How grateful we are for the cross. Who first saw the light and the burden rolled away. Don't ever get over the sheer ecstasy of that. Uh, Lord, uh, change is in order, and uh, uh, I'm first in line. After all these years of knowing you and walking with you, I'm just now learning some of these things. And I'm ashamed to admit that I'm like a juvenile in some of these things. I'm just learning them. And you've been faithful to work with me all these years. You've used four kids and ten grandkids in my life. You've used affliction and confrontation from brothers and sisters. You've reproved me, and I'm just now getting it. Give me a few more years, Lord, to live it out. I'd like to show you how much you mean to me. Keep me at the cross where change comes only from you. Change my heart. Change my motivation. Change my life. In the name of Jesus, everybody said,